I'm here with Rebecca Holden and Richard Rossi, who are both the creators of Canaan Land. Uh, Rebecca plays Sister Sarah, and I have Richard Rossi, who is playing Brother Billy. And uh, we're going to go on a little Hollywood tour today and see a lot of iconic sites. It will be lots of fun. But before we do, we want to introduce the movie a little bit. And uh, Richard, I was wondering if you could tell us just a short summary of what the movie's about. Canaan Land is a, a love story uh, between uh, Sister Sarah and Brother Billy. Uh, Sister Sarah is a sincere Christian, and she really is a believer. Uh, my character, Brother Billy, is a con artist preacher. He's just merchandising religion and doing fake tricks like the gold dust. You can see on the poster, I'm calling down gold dust, which is, of course, a trick. He gets glitter from a craft store. So he's uh, a con artist, and he falls for this woman. And this causes him to know the con game isn't a, a con anymore and to really try to get his faith back, because he doesn't really believe. Brother Billy is a con man, but Sister Sarah is the strong Christian who yes. is very upstanding. And yes. Rebecca, what was it like playing Sister Sarah? Oh, she's a wonderful uh, character that Richard created, and I think she is the epitome of, of what we, we all try to to be as Christians. I mean, we all go through struggles. We all f go through challenges. Uh, we all sin, of course, uh, but we are to love with a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And I, I think she is sincere in her faith. And she sort of is in opposition to the, the Billy character who uh, really reveals the some of the hypocrisy that exists sometimes in the church, the, the con man type, and we're, of course, to abhor evil and cling to what is good, and I think that's what this film is about. I'm hoping that this film, of course, entertains, which we want it to do, but also that it maybe um, provokes thought about the big issues in life. I ended up uh, finishing the novel <laughs> that the film is based on and also did the audiobook for the novels, which is out, and people are really uh, enjoying the novel, which is preparing them for the film. So there were certain things that happened we were able to incorporate into the film. I mean, as an example, Rebecca um, was asked to be one of the stars on the uh, annual Hollywood Christmas Parade mm. and, uh, you know, riding down Hollywood Boulevard. And she was, as, as you know, starred in the show Knight Rider. And I think they had the Knight Rider car, I believe, uh -huh. also. Yes. And so we got... The fans yeah. build replicas of the car and yes. they have events all over the world now oh. and fan conventions and so on. And they, they build replicas and they're parades of the cars. So they usually have one of the Knight Rider cars in the Hollywood Christmas Parade, which yeah. is always fun. That is so fun. Yeah, and so guerrilla film, see, we use that. So what we did was we put it into the story that after she breaks up with Billy, she just soars <laughs> and her ministry grows. And so they asked Sister Sarah to be in the Hollywood Christmas, right? So all this kind of stuff that adds like all this production value, we were able to use that had we finished the film when we intended to. I mean, another thing is Rebecca is one of the greatest singers in the world. And so she's sung at these big events. And so we use some of that footage that Sister Sarah is singing at these events. So um, the delay in not finishing the film worked to our advantage in some ways. You're both uh, actually talented musicians, because Richard, you started out as a musician, yes. and Rebecca, you're a singer as well. And one of the songs on the album was a duet, actually, with Jason Crabb, who's a wonderful, phenomenal singer. Uh, he was part of the Crabb family singers, who won multiple gospel and uh, awards for the for Emmys, uh, for Grammys, and yeah, the Grammy. Yes, you're right, and Dove Awards, and so. He duetted with me on a song called uh, Much Greater Love, written and produced by Joel Diamond, and that's used for the end title credits of the song, so we're very excited about that. Yeah, I grew up singing. I started piano when I was seven years old, grew up singing in church, was in all the musical productions and choirs and so on, and I, I think um, music is, is a gift that God gives to us. You know, music can sort of pick up where words leave off, you know, music has a way to connect us uh, to God and to our our inner core. Mm -hmm. I think there's something very special about music. Music is a big part of the movie, mm -hmm. and it's also a big part of church. Yes. So there were a couple scenes where you guys have a choir singing, yes. and yes. you're playing guitar, yes. and Rebecca's singing. Uh -huh. And now, did you arrange all that music, or...? You're definitely playing guitar and yes. singing because you, you are a yeah. musician. You wrote that song. Yes, yeah, that's a song I wrote called Canaan Land, the title. 
and uh, the choir uh, is from McCoy Memorial Baptist Church, a church in downtown OA. And I was really praying that I wanted a, a, a really great gospel choir. Uh, when I, I first did this story as a play at Stella Adler Theater and also in Long Beach, we had an amazing uh, uh, African-American gospel choir uh, directed by a friend of mine who passed away, Carla Drew, and it just added so much to the film. And I really wanted a great choir, and I was... Um, there's a, a gospel competition, and I saw this choir that just really did great. And I said, oh, I want that choir. Mm -hmm. So I contacted the church and went down and met them. I met the deacons. I met the pastor. They were all great, really oh. great, solid guys. And they they said they'd do it for us. And then so I wrote that song, Cain and Lamb, but something about Rebecca that she can roll with the punches, I'll tell you, <laughs> because I wrote a verse for her literally that morning, right? And um, and it's about you know I'm I'm on my way to Canaan land working with my preacher man like I wrote it about her and Billy, and I handed I had it on like a scrap of paper I don't know if Rebecca remembers this but I handed it to her literally before like right before we shot, and I felt a little embarrassed because Rebecca's such a consummate pro and uh, and you know. And she's worked on like great things like Knight Rider, Universal Studios, where they have this great budget and everything's planned and then everything. And I'm handing her this scrap of paper. I just wrote this. We're gonna, can we do this today? <laughs> and she, you know, she's, as you know, classically trained, really great trained. And she's like, okay. You know, <laughs> you know she's such a trooper, you know, because, um, you know, I've worked with other people of uh, celebrities and with, with, that are stars like Rebecca, where, uh, you know, because we're an independent production, and I and I do tend to be a bit uh, improvisational and have ideas come to me. Mm. Uh, I found like the great, great stars like Rebecca; they can just roll with it, you know, um, and um, and and go with that kind of. Uh, so Rebecca can work with a plan, but she's also just great because that whole thing with the choir and that song. Like I say, I gave Rebecca the verse. Uh, moments before, and she said, "Can you find me a tambourine?" And we'll do it. She, and she, she just I, went for it. She just went for it, man. Yeah, that's great. That, that's sweet of you to say. And and he has great inspirational ideas that come, and that's part of the creative process. And of course, R Richard is coming from a place of brilliance, so it's just been a joy to work with him. And no, I think that that is uh, the essence of film. Is probably one of the most collaborative mm -hmm. of the creative processes mm -hmm. it's 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 all a, a team effort and uh showing up and being able to be flexible and and rolling with with whatever comes Sometimes, you know, in the in the inspiration of the moment, you come up with things that are even better mm. than might have been originally planned. And so you have to trust God and that this mm -hmm. was meant to be and just go with the flow. Right. And you guys did have some moments where you did kind of have to film it differently, yes. I think, from what yes. I heard. Right. Like there's a scene in the car it, or yes. it's in your Jeep. Right. right. And you <laughs> you hadn't planned it that way. Yes. Can you talk about that? Yes. Uh, Jeff, who's manning camera right now, uh, was a real trooper also. Um, the, the beginning of the film is very much like this poster, a lot of fun and a lot of crazy characters, and it really just is a broad, pulls in people, be they uh, religious or not religious, it's just, but there's, the tone of the film gets more dramatic when when Rebecca's character realizes Billy is a, is a con, and like many good women have been involved with men that turn out to, uh, to disappoint them or cheat on them or steal from them. I've had many, many women say, oh, I can't wait to see this, I was with a guy that was, uh, empty my bank account or was cheating on uh, on me with the other all these other women so when she realizes that and breaks up the whole tone shifts and we were shooting this at the grove don't tell anyone this but uh sometimes independent films we steal shots but we were stealing shots uh without permits with the cameras and as it happens once in a blue moon hey you can't shoot put the cameras away so we had to shoot the breakup scene in the jeep at the grove with my cell phone and jeff's cell phone wow. and he's sitting in the back of the jeep 
But that added, I think, such a realism when people see the breakup scene, uh, and this is a spoiler that they break up at some point, but when people see that breakup scene, I've had women from age 20 to 70 tell me, oh my God, that's what it feels like when you have to do that Mm -hmm. that painful breakup. And and, and Rebecca's acting is great. It's very realistic. But I think the grittiness where it changes to that shot on a cell phone in the Jeep, I think it actually... Uh, help change that tone of the film and going into the deeper drama from the more campy kind of feeling the way it starts like that. I've let you into the sacredness of the Bethany Temple and I've let you into this temple. Fourteen years of purity I gave to you. You know, you're not the first man to fake faith just to try to get to me. You're just the first one good enough at it to make me compromise. I want to talk about the style of the film based on what you just said. Like, taking a look at this poster, Mm -hmm. it has a very kind of, yeah, like a fun feeling, a little bit, uh, what is this world? When I look at it, there's gold dust, you're wearing a gold jacket, Rebecca has her hand up, she's... What would you say the style of the movie is? Because it almost yeah. looks like it could be a musical or something, even yeah. looking at the poster. Yeah, it, it does blend a lot of things. It's a love story. There's also comedic aspects. Billy's very over the top, and it's funny. I mean, th- when you really look at, at how crazy some of these televangelists are telling people, mm-hmm. you know, uh, send in your $1,000 if you want to get healed, and all the crazy things they do. Uh, but then it's a serious drama. Um, there's an actress named Britt uh, Lind, who was in a lot of great films like Play Misty for Me and different things. And she wrote a re- beautiful review of the uh, My Canaan Land novel. Mm. And she said that this this takes you into a whole new world. She said, yes, she says, I've been around Holy Rollers. I've been around Pentecostalism. And yes, you have this world captured because mm. you lived in it. Because uh, I was a, worked in this world as a, a faith healing evangelist for many years in my young adult years, so I know this world. But she says, yet there's something about the tone of this film. It's like it takes you into almost a mythical whole new world. She mm-hmm. said the characters are just so unique in the locations all around Hollywood, right. which we'll be going to shortly. But she said it, it's almost like, yes, it's in Hollywood, but it, she said this this film and novel does take you into like a whole new world. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I've, I've seen that world, and I think he and I both have experienced the con man essence of, of uh, that kind of trickery and manipulation of people and those things I, I've seen a lot of people who who grew up in it who who turned away from the church completely mm-hmm. because of it and that's a sad thing he's blessing people Woo! get the gold dust brothers get the gold dust of sin and then I heard Sister Sarah, Sister Sarah's angelic voice reached a devil like me and now this is gold. This was an ordinary jacket, brothers and sisters, and the Lord touched it and the gold dust hit it. Woo! Just like he's hitting some of your teeth and filling them with gold right now. Do you feel that? Woo! Glory! Glory! Woo! Look in your Bible right at home. You'll probably find some little feather, some little gold dust. It's, it's been reported. They're sending in the videos. They're sending it on our Facebook page. People opening their Bibles, finding gold glitter. Woo! This is anointed. There's no church like this. Don't go to one of these pablum puking churches with these pansy preachers, these pussyfooting preachers. Come here and get the real stuff. The gold dust. Glory. And so... Rather than exposing this and thinking, well, it may turn people away from the church, Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the essence of this will draw people more to the church and realize that we're being honest about things that do exist, Mm -hmm. but you can overcome them and you can turn away from that and become real and sincere in your faith. And and Billy's character is the epitome of that kind of redemption. Mm -hmm. 
or the possibility of redemption. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're hoping for him. We're praying for him. <laughs> right, right. And he does have a big transformation at the end. So the film um, does present some possible controversy, right, among Christian groups. Yes. And you've probably already faced a little bit of yes. commentary about that. Now, are you zoning in on a specific type of Christian? Because um, there's so many different kinds of Christians, right? And what is this film kind of pointing toward? Well, yes, I do want to help people think critically because I have friends of mine that have come to me and said, we were a part of this church and we did this stunt and they put uh, gold glitter in the HVAC system and even one woman said, this is my job, I was the one that put it in. And they said it was the glory cloud and the presence of God. And people just flocked and even though I knew firsthand that it was faked, they flocked uh, in this case to this church and uh, they charged like 3000 or $4,000 to uh, learn miracles uh, at their school as a result because it, it raised their stature. Uh, uh, this uh, alleged gold dust miracle, which which I then Billy has does the similar thing, and um, when I've talked to people there and and present that it was faked, they don't even want to hear it, you know, um, because they have a great emotional experience through the music there or through something like that, and so I really hope I do get people to think critically, um, because people often follow politicians or preachers without uh, thinking critically and. I'm really hoping I get people to look inside themselves, you know. The Bible says um, you, not, you don't need another man to teach you. The Holy Spirit is inside you and will teach and guide you in all things in First uh, John 2, 27. So I think whenever people just blindly follow people without, um, without checking in with that still small voice, because we all, the Holy Spirit is described as a still small voice, and um, Sometimes we ignore it. People, if they have an impulse that something in religion is off or, or, or they see some claim on the internet that, that sounds a little out there, take the claim, put it into Google, and see, is this supported by evidence? Is this supported by multiple sources? Um, in this case of the fake miracles, I look at it like, okay, if you had a chocolate milkshake, but you put some dog poop in it, forgive the crude example, but yeah. would you really want to drink that chocolate milkshake? So a lot of the Brother Billies out there, um, please be careful out there, please be careful, and make sure who you're following, you know, walks the talk. Absolutely. I agree with that. Yeah, um, we were given a brain. God gave us a brain, and He meant to use us to use it, mm -hmm. use our wisdom and discernment. And and um, we're supposed to. We we talk about not being judgmental ever, yes. but we're supposed to use our good judgment mm -hmm. every day in every situation. And Sarah uh, wasn't really discerning about her beginning a relationship with, with Billy. And I think many, there are many good, sweet women out there who are easy prey mm -hmm. to the manipulation of, of men because they're trusting, they want mm -hmm. to believe the best, and maybe they uh, put on a veneer that doesn't exist of, of goodness and kindness, and this is my man, and he's... Because these con men are very good mm -hmm. at charming and and winning them over you know so we yes. have to we have to call on that small voice like like Richard said. Yeah, there's a scene at the end of the movie where you and Brother Billy are talking on the beach and he says uh, he wants to kind of come back into your life again. And you offer him forgiveness, but you tell him you broke my trust. Mm -hmm. And that's what mm -hmm. yes. that just made me think of that scene and how uh, what do you think about that? That's kind of a healthier, that's kind of a healthy way to forgive someone, right? Yes. We don't yes. want to just let them back we, into we our life. We forgive, but they have to earn their way back. Trust can be broken in an instant, mm -hmm. but it takes a long time of consistent, trustworthy behavior to earn it back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and sister, playing sister Sarah, did you have any kind of discovery like playing her or something that um, maybe uh, was revealed to you that you didn't know about yourself or something that God was showing you when you played her well I've, I've lived what she went through uh, so it was very close to my heart and I was glad to play a woman who had gone through that who had had um, trusted where it was not merited mm -hmm. and and that struggle to um, Keep believing, not lose your faith, call on your faith 
as you go through it. Um, you know, and uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Brother Billy, you know, he's a bit, he's really energetic. He's really excited to, yes. you know, perform all these miracles and signs and wonders. Yeah. Do you think that, how does, how do people like this get into the church and get up on a pulpit? Like, yes. why, why are they so, do you think that it's a failure of church leadership or like, why, why does this happen? People are seeking the transcendent. I know I really got into healing because I wanted to see what happened in the Bible happen, the way Jesus healed people. And so I, I got into it quite sincerely myself and do, praying for the sick. Um, and I was shocked as, as my healing services grew to uh, thousands of people coming at one point and us having to rent very big uh, halls. And um, I, I, I learned out to my shock that many of these uh, very famous ones were faking the miracles, having actors act things out, all kind of tricks. And it shocked me as a young uh, preacher. But, but the reason is, within the, a lot of these churches, they're seeking a high. They're seeking to use God as a drug. Like some of the churches that I studied in writing this, they have sayings like, there's no high, like the most high. Mm -hmm. So they're not, the way I say it is, they're not seeking a hymn, they're not seeking God as a person, they're seeking an it, the anointing, the high, the, the buzz, the experience. Mm -hmm. And so once it's about that, then it's almost like a drug. If a person's on drugs, they want the stronger high, they want the, the heavier drug. So they're always trying to top it. So... I mean, as an example, when I was working in the healing ministry and mentored by people like John Wimber with the Vineyard Movement, we were praying for the sick. We were very honest. If someone wasn't healed, we'd say, okay, this percentage of people aren't getting well. This percentage are getting well. These per this is the percentage that seem to have an instant healing. This, You know, we were very honest about it. And then people, uh, some of the ones that have been doing a lot of the fake stuff were hanging around us in those days, and they took it to the next level where it, it was always had to be some greater thing. Well, this church has gold dust from the heavenly streets falling. Well, this church is uh, raising the dead. And this, you know, mm. it's always like you have to up the ante and, um, and seek that, yeah. that experience. But the problem with any kind of addiction is mm. there's a crashing down you know? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the people using God in this addictive way, uh, they end up um, mm -hmm. crashing. Like a lot of the people I know that have gotten involved in this have had uh, major psychological problems and breakdowns mm -hmm. and things like that, um, because it's, a, it's an addiction. I mean, like even when I was doing healing services, I, I found Ashley, um, I would see certain people in the front of the meeting when I'd be doing healing, they'd be shaking and they'd be high and just having this incredible experience. And then it, uh, want prayer for this or that. And as I was traveling around doing this, I thought, isn't that the same lady that was in, I, I, when I preached in Wheeling? Isn't that, a, and wasn't she also in Cleveland asking for the wow. same thing? So they were like following, it was like like groupies, uh, uh, Grateful Dead groupies or whatever, <laughs> where they would just follow around just seeking the high, seeking the it. And um, it, I think it, may, it sets up the code. So if you can do this kind of stuff, it doesn't matter if you have character. It doesn't matter if you're a, a good person. If you can do the bigger miracles, okay, you're you're going to be at the platform of the pulpit, you know. That brings up an interesting point because uh, one of the verses in the Bible says that the gifts are without repentance. Yes. So Ooh. anyone can have these gifts right. based on that verse, right? And yes. not necessarily the character to back it right. up. So is right. brother is brother Billy gifted? Like, what are his gifts? The gifts of the Spirit in the Bible, the Greek word is charismata. Um, our daughter is named Charis, and I got that from the word for grace in the Bible, Charis. So it, grace means it's just given. It's undeserved. So just because a person's gifted, I mean, as an example, I, I've led worship on the guitar and written praise and worship songs and preached, and, and those are gifts and talents God gave me to do that, to get up and preach. For, by his grace. But that doesn't mean I'm a better person, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in character, because the fruit of the Spirit is the character part. And, and yeah, yes, mm. exactly. He's, he's extremely yeah. gifted. Mm -hmm. I mean, Brother Billy is, is talented. He has the gift of gab. Mm -hmm. He's charismatic. He's magnetic, yeah. which all those things mm. attract Sarah to him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so he, he was naturally given those wonderful gifts and, and ability to speak and be charming and, and have people drawn to him. Mm -hmm. But then it's how, how you use them. Do you mm -hmm. use them to manipulate? They're very powerful gifts. Mm -hmm. Do you use them to manipulate and use people and take advantage of people? Mm -hmm. Or do you use them for good? So, mm -hmm. 
Yes. And, and I think to, to, to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think Sarah is not going to give up on him. Mm -hmm. she, she, she realizes how talented and gifted he mm -hmm. is, but she, she's hoping that he points those in the, in, in the, gets pointed on the right path. And she and sees the good them. in people, mm -hmm. right? Yes. She wants so mm -hmm. much to help him. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been a great start to the yes. interview, and uh, we want to learn more about the film, and we want to go check out some Hollywood sites yes. and some <laughs> iconic places. So we're going to have a fun day, um, and let's get started. Yes. Ron Howard's father, Rance Howard, played the father of my main character in Sister Amy film I made. Ah. He became like a mentor and a kind of father figure to me. I miss him a lot. Ron played Opie. Yes. <laughs> in, the, in the Andy Griffith show. Yes. Oh, we in fact, it. Rance told me show. a story on set. He said, you know, Richard, they were going to make Opie more bratty. And I told the, because uh, he was also involved in writing, he said, I want you to make him, I think it'd be better you made him a good boy, the way Ronnie is with me. So when Andy Griffith, to, to do the father part, he studied the way Rance was with Ron. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how they got the father part. That for, show uh, was so beloved. Yeah. And each each episode had a little lesson, you know, yeah. of a value, family values, and yeah. I think it was a wonderful show for families to, to enjoy together. And of course, yeah. starting in, in showbiz, yeah. legendary show, and then he grew up to be such an incredible director. Hi everyone, we're here at the Lamley Theater in North Hollywood, and this is a theater known for its screenings of independent films. Now, Richard, you recently got an interesting phone call, an exciting phone call, right, from the Academy? Uh, yes, yes, and the, uh, you know, the Oscars this year, it's a little funny trying to get the screenings in, but the Lemley is one of the theaters the Academy told me yesterday when they called that they recommend I talk to to screen Canaan Land to qualify for some of the awards. So. Uh, Lemley goes way back to I think the silent movies Carl Lemley and it's been a it's just a great theater chain if you can uh, come see the independent art films here. That's really awesome. Yeah. And it's just nice that there are entities who recognize the value of independent films because not every film is going to be a huge mega budget film but they may in their smaller way have a significant impact and, and, and value to them. We're standing outside the Hollywood Bowl, which is a great venue for concerts in Hollywood. Now it's a little bit quiet inside right now, but this is the spot where Brother Billy has his big debut, right, as a pastor? Yes, Brother Billy calls down gold dust here at the Hollywood Bowl where the Eagles play, and he claims it's the glory cloud from heaven like some of the fake churches are doing these days, but it's all a big trick. And Sister Sarah is much more of a true believer, but she's taking care of Mother Grace, her spiritual mother, while Billy is building up the flock here at the Hollywood Bowl. Awesome, and there's been so many great concerts here that people go to. Have you ever been to a concert here? Oh, I certainly have. Of course, the Hollywood Bowl is truly a Hollywood landmark, so it's terrific that we have a scene here, actually, in the movie. I've been to many concerts here, the Eagles, uh, Linda Ronstad, uh, Bonnie Raitt, and one of my favorite events every year, they have a sing-along to The Sound of Music. And of course, I've known all the lyrics to The Sound of Music songs since I was a little bitty girl, so it's, I look forward to that every year, and everybody comes dressed in costumes, and it's, it's a true celebration. For now, we're going to go on to our next spot. Yeah. Now, this, this mural, by the way, is in the uh, uh, Canaanland credits sequence here at Hollywood and Wilcox. Billy walks by and the Canaan Land title appears over this mural and then becomes gold glitter and falls down. Wow. Elmer Gantry, Burt Lancaster, is kind of the same archetype as uh, Billy, Billy. Billy and Sarah. Uh -huh. and Gene Simmons played uh, Sharon Falcon in that film, which is similar to Sister Sarah. But we're, right. we're doing the same archetype, Elmer Gantry-ish story, but in a modern context. But this is quite a mural, isn't it? It is a great uh, backdrop and also it's interesting that your character is kind of like a celebrity and yeah. you have it set in Hollywood. Is yes. that on purpose? Yes, yeah. well yeah Hollywood is kind of like the Hollywood signs over there we'll get up there in our next stop but Hollywood is like the Canaan land the land of milk and, and honey where people come here to try to strike it rich right? Yeah. And then you have Charlie Chaplin. Yes and his granddaughter Kara Chaplin was in uh, my movie Sister Amy which kind of broke me in to do Canaan Land because it was a similar uh, treatment of religion. Oh. 
Uh, who else do you like here? A lot of work went into this. Yeah. Yes. Can you imagine? Yeah. yeah. We also have uh, Shirley Temple, right? Yes. She saved the studios because she was the only short money maker during the Depression, Shirley Temple. Aww. And Lassie. Yay, oh, Lassie. Lassie. I didn't even oh. see Lassie down there. Turn on this dog Just... over there. <laughs> We're here at the Hollywood sign, probably one of the most famous <laughs> signs in the world. And um, one of the opening scenes of Canaan Land is the Hollywood sign in the background. Now, why did you decide to make that one of the first shots? Hollywood is kind of like a Canaan Land in the story. Yeah, I can see that. What does Canaan Land actually represent? Well, Canaan Land represents um, coming out of the desert um, the Israelites were in the desert and the wilderness going through all these struggles and so on. It's a spiritual concept. Uh, a lot of the great gospel songs the African Americans wrote during their period of slavery was about Canaan land. It was that longing to be free. And so, you know, when, when, when Billy falls in love with the lovely sister Sarah, she kind of represents a Canaan land to him because he's homeless. He's been kicked out by his girlfriend. He's a hustler, but he's, he's now middle aged and he can't trade on his youth and looks much longer, that's for sure. So she's like his last shot at Canaan Land when he sees her and her ministry, so. Sister Sarah, uh, what, when you were playing Sister Sarah, I guess what drew you to Billy, Brother Billy? Well, of course he is charming and magnetic and he has that charisma, but uh, that's not what ministry is about, you know, this, um, we, we want to draw people to God. and. It kind of reminds me, um, when I see this Hollywood sign here, that this Hollywood sign is, is sort of the lure that draws people to this town, which has become a mecca for a lot of young people coming here, seeking fame and fortune. And it reminds me that many times when I have conversations with young actors, and I say, why do you want to be an actor? And they oh, I want to be famous. And if that is the reason that you're drawn to becoming an actor it's, it's a false it's a false reason because um, if you enjoy the work if you love the work because the art is going to to create a message to people to that that's what will be bring fulfillment and meaning you know the the fame and the fortune is is all false and shallow but uh, w the realness of uh, goodness and purity and, and drawing close to God is, is what makes the inner satisfaction. That's beautiful. And Hollywood has formerly had such a bad reputation in the faith community, yes. but more and more believers have been coming out to Hollywood and yes. you were drawn out to Hollywood, right? Yes. Um, this might sound a little um, metaphysical to some of our listeners or strange, but I was driving here a few years ago and I felt like that inner voice, that still small voice inside, say you're a missionary to Hollywood. Uh, shine, I kept having these dreams about a light shining from the Hollywood sign and, and that scripture, Matthew 5, that says, don't hide your light under a bushel. And I was asking God, is this, is this real? Is this what you want? And I felt this compulsion to leave my office and go down to the beach at Santa Monica. And I, I went down to the beach and there's a piece of paper blown on the ground and I opened it up and it was that same scripture about let your light shine. And it was, it was on a Hollywood tour thing it says, and it said Matthew 5, let your light shine, don't hide it under the bushel. So I, I have had, as Rebecca and you and many, we feel this uh, calling that uh, the arts are a way to shine our light, you know. There's been a lot more faith-based films. Uh, this is one film it's interesting that it's being produced uh, by Christians, but it takes more of a kind of a, it's exposing a lot of lies, yes, right? Yes. Whereas faith-based films tend to kind of highlight the goodness. So yes. what do you think of faith-based films? Well, yeah, I think that's a detriment of some of the faith-based films is they make the Christian characters um, so good and so perfect. And then if a character is not a Christian, they're like so uh, dark and evil. Um, one I can think of that some of my friends of mine acted in and made, which has been successful, so I want to give them partial credit for that. But they had the professor that wasn't a Christian, like he was so horrifically evil. Um, and... Um, 
when I was making Sister Amy, a many, there were some Christians uh, with her ministry that offered me a lot of money, but they wanted me to take out any of her struggles. Uh, I, they wanted me to uh, edit out that she had went through a divorce. They wanted me to edit out her depression and breakdown and things like that. And I said, no, I want to make an honest film. And, and, and so I had to turn down a lot of money that they offered. But many people that aren't uh, Christians said, you know, this is the most honest Christian film. You showed that this woman was, uh, that her faith didn't exempt her from going through humanity and struggles and things like that. So like Billy and Sarah, they all have these nuances and, and different parts to them. And um, I think we have to be honest. And I think... I think Canaan Land will be much more relevant to pe not only Christians but people outside the faith community because we are trying to be very, very honest about everything. If we were perfect, then we wouldn't have needed Christ to come and die for our sins. We're all sinners, and that's the power of redemption. That's why God became man and, and came to the earth to die for us so that we could be redeemed and exist with God in heaven eternally. This is known as the Walk of Fame, and you've got all these famous uh, stars. And one of the critical scenes in Canaan Land is uh, Brother Billy is walking by, and Wonder Woman Linda Carter is getting her star. And that relates to a great twist in the plot, which I don't want to give away to all you guys because you haven't, if you haven't seen it yet. So uh, Linda Carter, Wonder Woman getting her star, that happens right, right down the block here, and it'll be a, a key transition in the film. <laughs> We are standing outside where they hold the Oscars and we're gonna go inside. I've experienced real miracles um, and that's one reason I'm standing against the fakes is God's glory and magnificence and miracles are so beautiful and I love the gifts of the Spirit so much when they're legitimate that I don't like seeing that detracted from with the fakes and the cons, you know? Because a counterfeit bill bears evidence of something real, right? I mean, there's no counterfeit $3 bill because there isn't a real $3 bill. So all these counterfeits point that there is a real connection with God. There are real miracles and signs and wonders, but it's not fake gold glitter that you can buy in a craft store, you know? That's merely a dress, and we're each going to get one of them to wear when we're nominated. Yes. yes. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Ashley's pointing out there's some open spots for the future award-winning films, so yeah. uh, we're getting Kane and Land to fit in one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a great tour. What a fun day, Chris. What a fun Thank day. You. And we made it down all those steps. Yes. <laughs> so we need a break. <laughs> no, this has been great. It's been awesome. So yes. I think we should have that. I think so. Thanks for all the great questions and answers. Yeah.